So I think we are right on time and we can start. This next session is going to be heavily around Oresat, uh, which I think is a uh, long time overdue for oh, Open Source Keeps at Workshop. Um, oh, like, since, yeah, since you've been doing uh, great stuff for years now, and um, finally, uh, it's time to present them in depth on various different uh, talks that we have today. Um, and thank you uh, to all the Odessa team for being supportive um, and also submitting all those talks. And uh, I think it's going to be a great session. Um, so for our first talk, we have Andrew. Uh, and Andrew is adjunct faculty to the Electrical and Computer Engineering at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. And although his day job is in medical devices, his hobby is teaching and helping the Portland State Aerospace Society. Uh, an interdisciplinary student team of space hipsters who build amateur rockets and cubesets. Um, and for this first talk, um, let's go and come find out why building your own open source modular 1U to 3U cubesat system at the university is a terrible, costly idea that might actually work out in the end. So, Andrew, over to <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. We are super, super pleased to be here. And uh, it, it, Pierre, you're right. It's been it really. We should have been here years ago, but we were too busy staring at our own navels, uh, building our own system. So I'm going to just tear through these slides. I'm sorry. It's going to be a huge overview, and hopefully, this will give you the context for the for the slot. The sorry, the talks that follow that will uh, have more technical detail, um, and uh, will be presented by the students. So a quick uh, background for us. Uh, we are a student group in Portland, Oregon. We are interdisciplinary, so we're mechanical, electrical, computer science, and a bunch of non-engineering students. We've got uh, business people and physics and psychology. Even. It's, it's pretty neat. And the idea is that we kind of simulate a space program. We've got all the different things, including finances and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're completely open source. Everything we've ever done has been published uh, now on Git. And uh, we are crowdfunded mostly, although we do get some funds from the Oregon Space Grant Consortium. And we have no idea what we're doing. So that everything we're presenting to you right now is complete vaporware. You should not believe any of it. You should take it with a giant grain of salt, which is what we say in English, I guess, uh, for when you don't, you shouldn't believe it. Uh, but it's it, it's there. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting some feedback for you. So we started with rocketry. On the right, you see our one of our amateur rockets. And just to, to the middle right, you see an amateur uh, radio amateur rocket avionics system that we developed. And uh, we suddenly realized that, uh, in fact, that what we'd done is we developed a CubeSat that was cylindrical. <laughs> so we applied to the CubeSat launch initiative, which is a NASA initiative. It's like the QB50, right? Um, and uh, got in, shockingly. And so we started building a CubeSat. And as we were building a CubeSat, we realized that we were building something a little bit bigger than just one mission. Um, and the reason for this was we looked around because we didn't really want to design our own kit. We wanted to buy it or at least get an open source kit and build it ourselves. And, you know, you, you, all of you teams that are looking at, at CubeSats is the same thing, right? It's 35 K dollars for a one U or up to 125 K for a three U with ADCS. And so uh, we just couldn't afford it. Right. Um, but doing it yourself is stupid, right? You guys know this. These things are damn complicated. We, we, we can hardly put together, you know, as my team, one open source project, software project, let alone a huge interdisciplinary hardware software system. Um, and it's still going to cost you in the long run more than you'd like. So we looked around and we, we kind of put together a requirements list of what we really wanted. And it just, it just really didn't exist. We wanted a scalable design. We wanted independent subsystems. We wanted it open source. Um, we wanted scalable from microcontrollers to Linux boxes, and it really had to be student team friendly, meaning we could give chunks of the project to a student team. They could build a board, it could catch fire, we could fail them so they come back next year, and then the ones that do work we could put in the satellite and we could hot swap them and all that kind of stuff, and of course based on standards. So we thought, what could possibly go wrong? Let's do it ourselves. Yeah, no, yeah, this is not a good idea, and I, I don't recommend it. Um, it, we've been working on this, and it, we've known Pieros for for in, in Libre Cube and in, in Libre Space for a long, long time. But we've 
not really participated because we've been too damn busy building the system. Uh, and we spent hugely more money uh, on building the system than we would have uh, originally. So it's not a good idea, but we wanted it and we thought we were uniquely suited to do it. So we did it. So I'm just going to go over uh, uh, an overview. So the ORSAT system is a card cage system. It is, in fact, a uh, CubeSat developer specification Rev 13 and 14 compliant uh, CubeSat system. Uh, you can see here that we have a full CAD model of it, and this is uh, one of the early prototypes of it. These cards slide in and out uh, to a backplane. And why a card cage? And the answer is it's excellent for student teams because you can give cards to the kids and they can plug it in and they can catch fire and we can take it out and put another one in. And it, it's got a common API, right? A me mechanical, electrical, and even software API that we can give a student team. And that's really important. And so uh, we, when we were designing this, we thought, okay, we've got to make it hot swappable for the students. And we wanted something that wasn't a toy, right? It's really easy to make an educational project that's more Arduino than Linux box, right? And so we really wanted to make it dense and you know ready for future missions. So it's the way that we've done it, it's got about 40% more um, usable board area than a PC-104 stack. And there's about eight of these cards, we call them per, um, per slot. Uh, there's a problem though, which is that when you do these uh, card cages, it's really difficult to go up and down through the card cage. So Z-axis uh, traveling is hard, except on the back plane. So uh, we do have a scalable system. We've got a 1U CubeSat handed off right now. We have a 2U Cube, oh, sorry, 1.5U CubeSat actually uh, in design, a 2U CubeSat in design, and a couple other student teams around the world are building a 3U version of, of ORSAT, which is very exciting. Um, just some nomenclature. So these are the frames that we have. These are the cards we've talked about. The, the cards on the top and the bottom are, are special. And then there's caps that kind of fit the, the top and bottom on the z-axis. And then, of course, the solar modules go around the sides. Um, the structure itself is anodized aluminum, and it's machinable by students on a router, kind of. Uh, it's a little more complicated than it should be, but uh, the mechanical teams will talk about that. Um, we come up with these little kits. So there's a, a kit that you could put together satellite with. And uh, there's this really neat thing that the, the mecha mechanical engineers will talk about, which is the we get to clamp those cards in for vibration and thermal reasons. So I, I, I talked about this. Luckily enough, it's not that expensive to have made for you. If you go to hubs.com and you get um, one made, it's about $1,200. Although if you get 10 made, it's $400. So it's really, really, really cheap if you make them in bulk, which is what we're trying to do. I'm going to skip over this and let the, let the MEs talk about this. So what's in the bus, right? So uh, exactly what you'd expect from uh, a small CubeSat. It's got a uh, 2S1P, well, actually 2S2P kind of um, uh, lithium ion battery pack that's directly connected to the bus, so 7.2 volts. Uh, and we have this power control where we can power each of the different cards called the ORSAT power domain. And then we've used CAN, of course, right? So we've got two independent CAN buses right now that they're shorted together, but in the future we'll have two. And uh, I'm going to shut down the circuit for the whole thing. Um, on over here, you can see the main connectors here with all that stuff on it. And then we've got an area here for radio frequency connectors. Uh, we use SMPMs. And then over here, we've got an auxiliary port, and that's for Ethernet or whatever else you'd like between cards. One of the things that we really realized is that every single mission is bespoke, right? You need a system that you can use Every system is different. Um, we uh, are really thankful to Osh Park. You may have heard of them. They're an open source hardware park. I don't know what park stands for. Uh, and they support a lot of open uh, hardware projects. And so they're supporting us. We use their two layer process for the simple boards and four layer boards for the um, more complicated and the RFE ones. And they've been, uh, they've really helped us out. So in the satellite, we have three layers of computing that we'll talk more about in the firmware uh, talk. Uh, we have a Cortex-M0 based on a STM32 F091, and that uh, runs ChibiOS, which is a real uh, open source real-time operating system, and can open node, uh, which is can open, of course. And so that's the distributed thing that runs on batteries and solar panels. Then we have an onboard computer, or OBC, that we call the C3, Command Communication and Control. That OBC runs a Cortex-M. F that also runs ChibiOS and can open node. And finally, um, we have what we call mission processors, which are um, Linux boxes on a single chip. Basically, if you know the BeagleBone, 
this is a pocket beagle chip. It's an Octavo SM, sorry, OSD 335X dash SM. And uh, that's a, basically a TI uh, Satera processor with built-in RAM. And that runs Debian Linux. So one of the things that was really important to us is that we have we can onboard people really fast because students are terrible at this, you know, they don't know anything, so you have to bring them all up. So you can start with an $11 COTS development board from DigiKey or wherever. Then you can we can give you a little prototype board where you can solder and do stuff. And this is an actual uh, card that fits in the satellite. And then finally, you can graduate to an actual card that it has the application thing that's been built professionally and all that kind of stuff. But usually, you know, we're, we're building stuff in these ourselves. Um, there's also two levels of uh, software tools. So if you're working on a Linux box, you buy a Pocket Beagle, and that's your development kit. And then this is a uh, this is the, the same chip here is here, and then this is our Star Tracker. That's again theoretically built professionally. So far, we we always said we were going to have our satellites built professionally, but that satellite, the one you we just handed off was totally stuffed by students. So wish us luck. <laughs> um, each card. Uh, you can see here in the stack, you can see this little white FFC, flat flexible cable connectors. Those guys are how we uh, debug each card. It's common. There's JTAG, a serial port, and for the uh, Linux boxes, host and device USB, so we can talk to them as an as a Ethernet port. Um, and there's a, this common debug board that you can plug in USB cables and all that, and that's shared between cards, which is really nice. This is our flat set, so uh, we really we needed a, a really accessible uh, flat sat debug integration tool. So you can see here, this is our backplane. It's literally a ribbon cable between little cards that plug the cards plug into. So battery pack, inertial measurement unit, star tracker, OBC, et cetera. That way we can probe us up. So everything's based on CAN. We use CAN Open, in particular CAN Open Node, which is an open source library. If you don't know it, um, it CAN Open has its problems uh, and we are deep in them, but uh, it works, which is great. Uh, so just to quickly run through some of the subsystems that we currently have, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to blow through these. Uh, we have a uh, solar module that's talked about more in an upcoming talk, but they're Spectrolab uh, gallium oxide cells. They can, it can be uh, redone for silicon, and we hope to do that just to reduce costs for other people one of these days. We're super proud of these because it's a true maximum PowerPoint tracker in, on each independent module, and it's not just a controller, or it's not just a battery Nope, it's really an MPPT that's software driven so you can actually work on uh, the algorithm if you want and switch algorithms. The battery pack is exactly what you'd imagine. It's an 18650 cells. Um, it's 7.2 volts at 5.2 amp hours. There's about, you can fit about one battery card per U. So one U has one battery pack, two U will, could have two and three U could even have three battery packs if you wanted. Although now you're pushing some of the 100 watt hour limits, especially for ISS to play. It's got everything you'd expect, fuel gauge, cell balancing, all the things, and, and a heater, of course. A heater because uh, PRS told us to put a heater in. <laughs> um, so uh, the C3 is exactly what you'd expect. Uh, it's uh, the SM32 with uh, ChibiOS. It's got an L-band receiver at 1.26 gigahertz and a UHF transceiver up and down. Um, and that, that way we can do uh, full duplex. Uh, the only radiation tolerant thing on any of this is this one little comparator chip from TI, and that is our watchdog circuit that power cycles the entire satellite. When it goes off, the whole satellite shuts down. There's some FRAM and RTC, and then we've got 16 gigs of uh, storage to just uh, hold on. Um, we have a cute little uh, tri-band uh, deployable turnstile antenna. So you can see here, this guy right there is the stowed antenna, and this is it after deployed standard uh, uh, tape measure antennas at UHF L-band and also L1, our GPS antenna. And it's uh, RHCP, right-hand circular polarized and omnidirectional. So this is uh, an example of one of our star trackers. Um, we use a on semi, either black and white or color uh, CMOS sensor. We're flying as a color because we want Earth images, not just star tracking. Uh, it runs Open Star Tracker, which is this amazing open source project that we uh, are excited to fly. We've written our own uh, kernel driver for something called the, uh, oh gosh, programmable real-time unit that runs on the Satera that interfaces with the uh, camera. And of course, can open node and Python and running, all, running on Debian Bullseye. Our GPS is similar. It uses a commercial off-the-shelf uh, Venus GPS receiver that's been uh, got special firmware for space. 
as well as uh, SDR GPS receiver, the MAX 2771, which is not functional right now, but it's up there. And so uh, we hope to finish that using GNS SSDR, and again, can open node Python bullseye. Uh, and you all know we need ground station, right? So uh, we're extremely, extremely, extremely happy about SatNogs. Thank you, SatNogs people, because we would be dead without you. Um, and we um, we need SatNogs comms now, <laughs> right now. And so we uh, we didn't wait. We uh, made our own thing, and 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 we played off SatNogs, and we hope one day to play directly with SatNogs. And we call it Uniclogs, the University Class of Ground Station. Sorry for the name. It, they're expensive. They're like 10k each, but you know, fully SDR, transmit enabled, good antennas, commercial antennas. And uh, we've got one that's being built in the UK right now, and we've got one, two here in Portland, and we hope to have more around the world that we can start sharing uh, communication, uh, transmit capabilities, and of course, regulatory compliance. Right? We don't, we don't, we don't know what that means yet. So, just to wrap up, we have three missions right now. Uh, Oregon, the state of Oregon's first satellite was just handed off last week. Uh, it's on Transporter 3 that's coming up no earlier than January 10th. Thank you to Spaceflight Industries that gave us the free ride, which is amazing. And uh, that was fun to integrate up in Seattle uh, last week. Uh, uh, so that's where we're going. It's an ISI deployer on uh, the Sherpa orbital transfer vehicle, which is called Sherpa LTC-1. Uh, we're now building ORSAT 0.5 because for reasons we called it this, and this is a 1.5 U bus, again, for reasons that we didn't expect. And this is gonna be a test of our attitude determination control system, which will most likely catch fire in space as opposed to actually work, but we're gonna test it because after this, uh, we finally get back to the original ORSAT project that was a CubeSat launch initiative project uh, that from back in 2017. And uh, that's for a handoff in late 2022. So late next year, about a year from now, we'll be handing this off. And this has got the full ADCS and uh, shortwave infrared cameras and a, a bunch of other missions. Uh, so thank you. Um, please contact us. Um, we are coming out of the woodwork now or the closet or whatever you want to call it. And uh, happy to start working with our peers and super happy to find out about LibreCube and uh, who are going to solve all of our CCSDS FDP problems for us. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so questions. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that was super awesome to see and um, the progress and how far you, you, you've come and congratulations on your delivery last week. That's, that's a huge milestone, I can imagine. Um, so there are already a few questions here. Um, so, for example, for can open node uh, that it has no profiles for uh, for motors, uh, for, for O2 motor support. Like, did you have to add this one? Or Yeah, so we're bad at can open. Um, and so we uh, didn't bother with the sort of device profiles, I think they're called, for motors or for this and that. Um, we just used our own PDOs and SDOs and mm -hmm. things like that um, for each thing. So, yeah, we, no, we, we didn't bother. Okay. Uh, there's another question about um, if you can elaborate a bit about the selection of the backplane connectors. Oh, yeah, we went through a lot. Um, I, I, I'd encourage people to contact us offline at orsat at orsat.org, um, and uh, and and we we have a lot of uh, documentation about why we chose these things. We chose these things because they were high density, you know, 1.27 millimeter connectors. Uh, they've got great um, uh, uh, sockets and pins. Uh, try they have three connectors each, so they're super reliable even through vibration. And we want to run these on rockets, so we care a little bit more about vibration than most. And they're super high density and they've got great, um, you know, one of the worst things you can do is give an electrical engineering student something that's precise and mechanical, right? <laughs> and so and so it's got a lot of uh, uh, robustness and a lot of angular and uh, displacement misalignment, which works well. Same thing with the SMPM connectors. There's a there's a barrel that goes between them so they can have like up to half a millimeter of, of misalignment and they still okay. break, which is great. So all of those back claim protectors were very, very, very carefully chosen. And we actually went through like three or four revisions. Cool. Um, there's a more general question regarding the cost of uh, one U cubes at um, the ground station, which I suppose it depends on what you're going to put inside of it, right? But um, we, 
we come up with a, uh, we say for a one U CubeSat, you could build an ORSAT for $5,000 or less. Um, and we think you could be aggressively less, like two or $3,000 if you did it right. But I, I wouldn't recommend it, so it's more like 5,000. But you always need to build at least two or three. You can't just build one, right? And so that means you're really gonna end up spending, I'm gonna say about $7,500 for a small fleet. We do everything in threes because we get three circuit boards from Osh Park. So we build you know, engineering unit, flight unit, and a destructo backup parts unit. <laughs> and uh, the ground station's like 10K, it's expensive, uh, maybe even 15K. So you're talking about a minimal investment for an entire system of probably 20 to 25K US dollars. Cool. That's cool. Still... I, I also have a, a couple of questions, but they were specific and maybe they will be handled in the next presentation. But how about testing? Um, testing. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> like, put your, did you put it in a vacuum chamber and a vibration? Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. We didn't. We didn't have chain time to talk about that. And I, I should get off and let the other folks talk. But yes, we we have a local, uh, very janky, by uh, uh, T back chamber, and we have a local vibration table that we use. And uh, and then there, of course the real testing is the integration testing for software, right? That's the really big deal. So we have a. That was flat side. I guess I talked about that. And I'll we'll talk okay. about that. Thanks. Thank you. Guys. Uh, and I think that we have a question, um, you know, some time for a final question, uh, which is a more broader one. Um, what do you wish you knew now, back when you started? Everything. Uh, I, I think that for those of you who've gone through a CubeSat before, you realize that it's everything's super, super terrible. Uh, everything is hard. Everything's a trade-off. And that's part of the fun, really. Like, so that's why we like these things, because it's, a, it's an exercise in system engineering. But I, I think I would have liked for someone, like really, hats off to uh, UPSAT for being the first one and for sharing everything with us. Go, I. I I wish there were more projects that we could look at and and like that and see. So and I, I wish we did more research uh, when we started rather than just kind of cavalierly blinded, blindingly started off on our own thing. Uh, we've learned a lot and this kind of thing would, would have been great, you know, five years ago when, when we started, had we looked around, so. Well, we, we look the thoughts on you carrying it uh, with uh, such grace and uh, setting again the, <laughs> everything that you can. So th thank you for uh, following up on this trend and actually being so much committed on open sourcing and documenting in, in such detail your project. It's, it's really uh, remarkable to see. Um, and with, with that, um, I think we can move on to our first more in-depth presentation.